This is the um, LIC Board of Trustee Board Workshop on to discuss the 9th, 10th grade campus, uh, grade centers. I would like to announce that a quorum is present and the meeting has been duly called and notice that the meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act. The time is 6.01. Workshop, uh, 9th and 10th grade centers. Um, Dr. Waddell, would you like to start? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we'd like to begin with uh, 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 Dr. Rogers, and he has a presentation. Basically, what we tried to do is pull as much data as we could, primarily focus on the matrix, the metrics that we showed you all and we approved last fall. So, we we'll turn it over to Dr. Rogers. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, board, you should have a uh, folder that has four items in it. One, a copy of this PowerPoint. The second item in there is the one-page metrics that you uh, approved in December. You know, the fair request that you gave us, the task of, hey, how are we going to measure it? The third thing is a copy. One of the things that our metrics request is parent involvement. Well. The best way I knew to ask about parent involvement at this stage of the game was to ask the three PTSA presidents, the PTSA presidents at the three schools. And so you have a letter from each of them in your packet. And then the fourth thing, um, I'd ask Mr. Ellington to sort of give me some numbers regarding transportation costs. And so actually several weeks prior to this board workshop being set this is an email exchange between uh, craig martin and richard blatchley that i included so um, so here we go um, as i said you've been provided a copy of the metrics that was recommended by the farmer focus committee uh, just a reminder the farmer focus committee is consist of uh, eight parents, three community members, 11 teachers, and eight LISD administrators. But one thing I want to remind you in December when we talked, when we were talking about the metrics is that some of the data that's on the metrics really requires a combination of two years to set the baseline. You know, we, we, we said it was for 910, and so some of the data uh, I don't have. If you remember, uh, and certainly, uh, when you have the 910s, when I was in charge of the Farmer Focus Committee and the committee prior to that, Mr. Bonner has been in charge of the committee this year. But, you know, really the, dis the discussion amongst Farmer Focus Committee members is how can we create the best of both worlds? How can we create smaller learning communities for our kids where they're not one of 3,500 and at the same time, give them every opportunity that a kid in a larger high school has. And so really, that's what we've tried to do. When you have smaller kids, you get to know them personally, you, you can certainly put, put in place support systems a lot easier. I do want to remind you that this is actually the 15th year that LHS has had a satellite campus. So this isn't something new that that we started a couple of years ago, 15 years ago, and I and a few of us were around. Uh, hard, it's hard to believe, but it was 15 years ago that they first opened uh, the ninth grade campus over at Old Milliken Building. Uh, the disclaimer is, is what I said a while ago. Some of the data is not complete because it depended on really ninth and tenth grade data. But, I've tried to follow the, the metrics, so if you look along the, along the side of the metrics, the three main criteria that the Farmer Focus Committee uh, decided is we want to focus on academic excellence, pride and tradition, unity and consistency. So what I've done is just go down this page and try to tell you what indicators where we're at April 30th. 
So if we talk about pre-AP and AP enrollment, certainly our goal in the LHS feeder pattern, as all feeder patterns, is how are we going to bump up pre-AP and AP enrollment? <coughs> Not only are we going to bump up enrollment in those courses, but then it, we want to make sure those kids feel prepared and have opportunities to take the AP exams. You know, a lot of times you can funnel kids into the classes, but if they're not taking the exam or they're not passing the exam, then really we sort of miss the boat. But if you look over the last three years, we've increased this year's for next year. This is based on student request, and I need to make it clear that we use AVID to then, once the scores are in, we go and target AVID kids. Those folks go and target AVID kids. So if we had looked at last year's numbers at this time of year, their numbers would be much lower than 47%, 20%, 24%. But because then they had the opportunity to see, hey, how the kids do on, on ELCs or for last year, of course, tax, and then who are we going to target to go meet personally with their parents and with the kid to get them into the AVID program? When they do that, those numbers in ELA will bump up. Increased AP exam participation, you can look. We nearly increased 100 students taking <coughs> AP exams from 2010-11 to this year. Those AP tests are coming up in the next couple of weeks. And then PSAT practice test. The PSAT test is something that's given to 10th graders. It's part of the National Merit Scholar Program. You can sit there. Um, but what's happened is we always give practice tests to AVID kids. And you can see the numbers. 92 last year, 132 kids were tested in AVID this past fall. But now what the two schools are doing is now they are testing every kid in the PSAT practice test every spring. So that's only going to help show the college readiness of all the kids at both Kilo and Harmon. Okay? Another one of our academic excellence indicators, <coughs> attendance data. Well, you can see whether you're looking at the three years, attendance data is good. When you get in the 96s, 90, 96 and a half, you know, there's not going to be a lot of movement one, one direction or the other. The, the one area that I can't tell you, of course, is this last six weeks. That's to be determined. We looked at passing rates. How many kids are passing the nine weeks? Ninth graders, this is all ninth grade. And you can see the passing rates are the same. And of course, I can't tell you this nine weeks data. The discipline data, which is one of the indicators, I, I don't have that accessible yet because the way discipline data works is it's entered into uh, the system by the assistant principals and then it's entered into PEANS and we're not, we're not to that point yet. <coughs> So that's the data for, uh, for attendance, grades, and discipline. When we look at the next category, pride and tradition, we talk about farmer athletics and fine arts. One of the things that the Farmer Focus Committee, I know, I, I know you, the board, wants to make sure is how can we build and make sure we sustain tradition and pride in, in the farmer system. And one of the things that we targeted as, as the farmer folks, I mean, we've got to get kids out. We've got, to, we've got to get them involved. Some of these numbers I was just provided this afternoon, but I was pleasantly surprised. Oh, no. hello. Wrong button. I was pleasantly surprised if you look in athletics, we've increased. I did include the 10th grade, because to me, when you're talking about 9-10s, you've got to look at both 10th grade and make sure you're comparing apples to apples. But if you look at just the total, 9th and 10th graders, 10-11, 9th and 10th graders, 11-12, 9th and 10th graders for next year that have signed up for some athletic next year, you see an increase. 
Also look. Arm and about kill are just ninth graders? I'm sorry? Arm and kill are just ninth graders? Yes, sir. Just okay. ninth graders. Okay. <clears throat> when you put the pencil to it, I'm a former science teacher, so but when you put the pencil to it, about 38% of LHS 9th and 10th graders participate in athletics. That's, that's not bad. I mean, uh, that's pretty comparable. It's a little lower than some of our other schools. But in this year's data, and then next year's registration, students that have signed up for theater, art, orchestra, band, choir, and the total. This is 9th graders only in all of these columns. So we see about an 18 to 20 percent participation increase each year. <clears throat> now, if you look at it closely, there's some hiccups. For instance, in band, I might look and say, okay, now why did I go from here 103 to 81? And I ask that question, why did we? Well, it just happened to be a large class. You know, sometimes you have larger groups of students coming through your system one year than the next. So to me, I focus more on the total. How many of our kids are participating in fine arts programs? There's no doubt sometimes that participation rate increases, increases because we might add a teacher. You know, it's sort of that build it and they will come attitude. All right? But the bottom line is one of the farmer focus uh, points that they want to emphasize and what you approved on the metrics is we want to increase participation in athletics and fine arts. The next category talks about unity and consistency and there's several indicators on there. The first one is professional learning. In other words, what are we doing for our staff to work together to pull this system off with three schools? Well, last summer, in 2011, there was a strategic planning meeting with all ninth grade staff. Actually, the teachers were funded by HR, all right? And so they came in together. They worked during the summer to plan to get the, school, the schools off with the new staff. In August, there was a, a day of joint professional learning. Last August, where the two schools worked together. This upcoming summer, there's also planned, now we're going to roll in the 10th grade teachers at the two campuses and have that joint strategic planning, once again, gratefully funded by HR and Dr. Haynes. In August, they already have planned a joint professional learning opportunity between the campuses. They already do some virtual Department PLCs and department planning through video conferencing. And I had to ask, okay, what's Polycom? It's a video conferencing uh, a tool that allows them, so teachers from Harmon can already work face-to-face -face with teachers at Kilo and vice versa. And then they've gone through K and training. What's K and training? Cooperative training. Thank you. The next uh, thing on the uh, Unity and consistency are campus activities. So I just listed a few examples. There's, there's a, a long list of examples. They created a, a cell program, which is student ambassadors. What's they that? Are, she wants to know what that is. Student ambassadors, they um, are ambassadors for the school that do a lot of community service. They're in the middle of doing a book drive. They're researching the community, what they can give back. So they're so not part of student council? Um, it could be, but it, it is separate. And in fact, they knew the one that wanted it, really. When we started talking about it, it was a great thing. Who they had to apply. Allison. Allison. Yeah, she said Allison actually is the one that promoted it. Uh, they are creating new UIL academics teams. They have increased the number of student clubs uh, by what they call block lunch. Uh, they've increased the number of student leadership opportunities. Uh, to, there's more students in student council now than ever before. Matter of fact, uh, I was sort of uh, pleasantly surprised when Mr. Bonner, uh, he saw this on the slide and he mentioned a conversation that he had with Ms. Stamey, who has been you know, a member of our Farmer Focus Committee uh, for a long time. She certainly asked hard questions. I mean, she, you know, 
but uh, I'm going to ask Buddy to share that conversation. Yeah, it goes back to uh, the formal folks meeting January or February. So we were kicking around uh, ideas or, or issues that have come up over the course of the year that need to improve. You know, we wanted to be proactive and address those. And one of the things that Allison said spoke to that. She said, you know, when, when we first started looking at this, she was concerned how it would roll out. In fact, her question, her statement, her statement was, what would it look like when these freshmen are seniors? You know, she had their best interest in mind. What's it going to look like? And I asked her uh, uh, as follow-up in anticipation of this meeting a couple of weeks ago. I said, well, what, you know, where is it now? Are, are, what are you hearing? Is there satisfaction out there? What, what's, the, what's the situation? She said that her initial concern with this configuration was really worn out because they had in Plano. She said in Plano they discussed that their programs and clubs Enrollment diminished once they got to the senior high. And she asked why, and she said that there was no connectivity between the campuses. They were two standalone campuses with a, with a bridge between them. And she said that's why she's appreciative uh, for the transportation and back and forth because it allows them to continue to have a relationship 9 through 12. Uh, and that's what she reported to me last week. So. Um, Certainly there's been great collaboration between the three campuses on other student council activities and LHS activities. Now there are two sets of class officers, one at Harmon, one at Kilo. So more clubs, so more club officers, so more kids have the opportunity to be in leadership roles. Increased student participation in AVID. They had a Unite pep rally back in October where the two schools came together for a pep rally. They're creating a new octathlon team. Octathlon is an eight event uh, academic contest versus academic decathlon is 10 events. So uh, they will be the only schools in LISD to have an octathlon. I remember uh, Marcus had an octathlon about 15, 18 years ago. I haven't seen it since. So I'm excited about that. They've had two combined school dances where they bring the kids from both schools together. And, now, and they've created a broadcast between the two schools called Farmers United News, or what they call FUN. The next, the next indicator on uh, unity and consistency is parent involvement. And, and I, as I said, I didn't really know how to find that out without asking the three PTSA parents. You have copies of their uh, comments, their full letter uh, in your folder. But I just wanted to point out, uh, Ms. Walker, uh, the LHS PTSA president, talks about how last year there were 11 volunteers on the PTSA board and no president. Uh, now we've gone and we've increased to 34. Uh, many of the volunteers feel comfortable or have time to serve a thousand or two thousand students. So serving three campuses is not an issue for PTSA. Uh, Ms. Loggins, who is not here, uh, but she is the uh, Harmon president, and Ms. Loggins has been on the Farmer Focus for a long time. Actually, she was on the, the first committee, and she, she was always honest that she had some trepidation about, you know, the three camps. And so I was pleasantly surprised. To, uh, she's a mother of a student at the 9-2 campus. In your letter, in your folder, she actually talks about the mother of also a, an LHS grad that's a sophomore in college. And she talks about uh, her feelings about the 19 campus and that she has not heard any anti 19 comments and the parents that she talks about and, and talks with. And then um, Mr. Weston uh, is the Kilo PTSA president. One of the comments I took from his letter is the creation of the 910s has allowed the PTSA to grow to levels I don't think would ever see under the old ways. <coughs> re-emphasizing what Ms. Walker talked about and how it's benefited them where they can benefit the youth of the three schools. Uh, transportation, that's everyone's, uh, you know, sort of thing hanging around our, our neck. I, I, so I just put this summary of transportation, this slide. There are 31 routes that run between the three campuses of periods one to four. Beginning this year, the principals worked very closely together to limit 
uh, bus transportation during second period. Okay, so there were there were no kids going between the three camps of second period. The only exception, and I wrote it, sometimes a kid if they move in to the school, let's say in February, and their classes don't match up, then we're going to get them to the right place. Maybe they're a tenth grader, but they they moved from a state and they didn't have you know the right history. All right. So we've got to send them to the right place. There have been 16 of those kids that we have transported in second period. Uh, classroom to classroom, the amount of time. Certainly you wish you could wave a magic wand and there'd be no loss of time. Instructional time is 14 to 16 minutes. Now you remember out of the 14 to 16 minutes, is it seven minutes or eight minutes is the passing period? Eight for us. Okay, uh, five minutes for them, eight minutes at the main campus. So some of that time is passing period time of the 14 to 16 minutes. So it talks about how the teachers uh, accommodate that. I guess I, I'd like to remind people, historically, I'll jump down a bullet, the time is a lot less than what it was 15 years ago. Not great, but it's less than what it was 50 years ago when they were going to the new delayed middle school side. So impact, first period, there's no impact because parents or the bus drop them off at the campus where their first period class is. Okay, second period, I've already talked about the minimal impact with the kids that might move in. Third period, students travel to the appropriate campus after they eat lunch. So they go and eat lunch first, and then they get on the bus. And then fourth period, that's where the majority of the transportation occurs. That's where the top bands are, that's where a lot of athletic classes are, so on. Comparison of, of travel time, I, I just asked to, to look at the comparison of travel time to our two career centers. Career centers from LHS to CC, uh, Career Center East is 18 to 22 minutes, and then from LHS to Dell Jackson is 8 to 10 minutes. I want to uh, remind you about the 9-10 alignment does allow for the system to become a little more efficient. One, when you have two grades that kids can take a larger range of courses from, that will actually end up in less transportation to other campuses. For instance, some people say, well, you know, ninth graders just take a pure list of ninth grade classes. It doesn't work that way. Half of our ninth graders take algebra, half of them take uh, geometry. I mean, so now with a wider selection, it actually will probably <coughs> limit or, or reduce the amount of transportation. The other thing, of course, is the cost. The cost is great. Uh, in the email that you have between Mr. Martin and Mr. Blatchley, talks about nearly $665 a day for those bus routes to run. When I multiply that times 180, that's where I came up with nearly 120,000 a year. If you read the email, though, from Mr. Blatchley and uh, to uh, Mr. Martin, it talks about that he was greatly surprised because in the past, before two ninth, ninth grade centers, Harmon and Kilo, it was running us about $500 a day. So at least it wasn't doubled because we, as the two schools and the administration, have worked to reduce transportation second period and, and other things. We've actually said, hey, you know what? Let's have teachers go to where the students are when it works that way versus making students ride the bus to the teacher. So we've tried to look at it from that direction every chance we could. LHS by the numbers. Capacities, the new LHS according to Mr. Perry, wherever he's at, built for 2200. LHS Harmon capacity was built for 1,200. Kilo, 1,100. Enrollment, numbers from Mr. Ellington. Our current enrollment at the three schools, 
totals 35, 31, and there's the way it breaks down. Projected for next year is 38, 38. Remember, they roll up existing eighth graders, look at the existing classes. And so that's a projection for the three schools under the 9-10 system. All students have already completed student registration. Now, I'll be honest with you. If, if you want to change that, we can make that work. I mean, that's our job, is to make it work. But I do, I do want you to understand, all students have completed registration, and all staff, the principals with HR are finalizing the, the staffing list, meeting, determining which 10th grade teachers go to which campus, which assistant principals will go to Harmon, Killo, Counselor, so on. And some of the core teachers have already been notified. So then my last question to the principals and to Mr. Bonner, it's nice to have a central zone leader, is, buddy, have you received concerns, complaints, emails about either transportation or, you know what, my child can't get the class that they wanted because of this configuration? And he told me, absolutely not. We talked to the principals. They said there were no concerns, except for the regular stuff that you run into at the first of the year, such as, which bus do I get on? How does that work? And the same as far as courses. We don't want, and I know you don't want, any kid not to have the opportunities of any other uh, school. I mean, that's not, that's not what we're about. And we would make sure and work any and all that out. And so, it's great to see those kids. I don't know which school that's from, but I know they love being in those overalls, decorated as farmers. So I know I've gone fast. I'll try to answer any questions you have, or I'll point to the person that might have questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have a question. What, what are the names? Has it just been perfect? Oh, no. Now, you know, uh, Mr. McDaniel, we, we created the Farmer Focus Committee because we wanted to work <coughs> on the issues to transition to this system. You know, um, there's always going to be negative. Um, there's always going to be things that have to be worked on. Uh, but. I think according to the people that you, you talk to, whether it's PTSA parents, whether it's you know the Allisons of the world, we and you as a board have given permission through busing, which means that all of our kids are working together as farmers at LHS and athletics and in fine arts, you know, so y'all through that extra expenditure from ninety thousand, that's what we were spending previous to this year on busing between the two campuses to 120, y'all have allowed us to work out most of those keys. But you didn't answer the question, what are some of the negatives? <clears throat> lost, lost instructional time. To me, that's probably the greatest. I mean, you know, no one likes to lose instruction time. Uh, so that's, you know, to me, I don't know. Y'all have any input on that as far as I think the one thing I heard the kids say is the social aspect of it. I was talking to Mr. Weston's daughter, Holly, about it. She's our new vice president for 10th grade. And she asked me, she goes, do you believe in the 910s, Ms. Flores? And I said, down to my soul, I do. And I think we're about to see it this next year because of the extensive planning we put into it with Octathlon and, and kids getting more involved in the clubs. And, you know, I was there when it was just 9th grade also. Great, great place. But we know half the kids this year coming back. And, and I was thinking about it a couple weeks ago. It's really sad for me to think about them leaving right now because you've just gotten to that. I mean, you're like there. You're, you know, there's, when they get in trouble, they actually just say it because they know they're going to get caught. There's this camaraderie that's different. But one thing Holly did say, she goes, I do miss my friends over at Harmon. And we were talking about it, and we went on to talk about that a little bit. So that is, to me, the one. There's the transportation, the loss. And then there's a there's a certain social aspect for our kids. So Holly and I, and Jerry, I mean, she may have come home and told you about this conversation. We went.
went on to talk about, I said, but you're going to be back together when you're in 11th and 12th grade. And she goes, you're right. And she goes, I, I go, I don't know that you're going to see the benefits of, of being in smaller communities, being a leader next year for the ninth graders until you're a junior and senior. I don't think you're capable of doing that when you're 14 years old, of going, this really is that good for me. Well, and I think, too, just to add to that, it'd be different if we were using the Plano model where, you know what, the 910 is totally separate. But if they're involved in any activity, they're going to see they're going to see their friends at the main campus. And I will tell you, as a former principal, you know what, when you have 3,000 plus students, you know, they might not see their friend uh, very often except in hall passing time either because they might not have any classes, just the way it schedules together. So. I'd be much more concerned about the social aspect of it if we weren't trying to funnel and keep that farmer unity at the main campus. If we were trying the, the Plano model, there'd be a whole lot more concerns. And I think that was the, the thought of the Farmer Focus Committee and all the parents uh, when they went over for that site visit. And graciously, that was not ever the model that we, we wanted to do. And that's where we ended up going with it. We talked about all those things that they do have together, the dances and the pep rallies. And, and so it was a very positive conversation. But that's the only thing I hear kids talk about. I mean, and so it's their life right now. That is their life. Sure. They don't see all the academic support, all the leadership opportunities. Um, so those are the two I can think of. And other than that, I mean, everything's going up. They're more involved, more pre-AP, more AP. We're going to offer AP Biology ninth grade next year. I mean, that's that's a feat. Not every high school has AP Biology. Um, well, high schools don't. I just know Flower Mound does. Sherry is back there. She might know right. science. That's course. the only one that offers AP Biology to freshmen as well. And now we'll have the one. So we're really excited and proud and going out recruiting. And we're looking at how we can identify our National Merit Scholars and get them in a little cohort so that they can have more people more SAT practice than, than they were getting. We're really directing things right to ninth and 10th graders. We're looking at clubs, our kids have asked for clubs regarding money, clubs regarding getting ready for the SAT. We're running EOC reviews through block lunch. There's just been a lot of positives that our kids are benefiting from because they're getting very targeted support. And when you're at a big campus with all that's very hard to, to think like that constantly. The social part's a small percentage of the kids, though, right? Because the majority of them follow their feeder pattern with the same kids. Oh, they'll be back together, yes. Like, how well, goes Hedrick all to Kill Up, um, Durham goes all to Harmon, Delay split down the middle, most of Hedrick goes to Harmon, most of Harmon. Um, and yeah, we have seven different splits in the city of Louisville. As far as when they're in elementary school, they split go to middle school. In the middle school, they get split again. We have, Louisville has the most of all the other communities as far as splitting the other school. From an academic standpoint, just ranking the five high schools we've got, we're in Louisville, right? Academically, kind of a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, not very loaded. <laughs> my, my point being, we're at Louisville. I've got to feel like I know the answer to that question. And if looking at that, this is the high school where we think the kids are put on the road. So well, let me, or whatever. let me try to answer your question. First off, uh, Mr. Knapp, I'll put the top uh, students at LHS against the top students of any other school. Okay, I, I believe when you see that and what we've, what we've been trying to say is, you know what, some kids come to some of our schools and they need extra support and they they have a little higher hill to climb but when we get to 11th and 12th grade your the lhs scores will match any other school scores that are i mean and so you know would we want like to improve the notion the number of national merit scholars absolutely you can't do that by saying hey we'd like to you got to do it ground up by increasing the number of kids in pre-ap and ap classes getting them through those PSAT practice. Uh, so I think we're trying to build that foundation broader. And we have to be realistic. There are, 
there's a, a large group of kids at LHS that need some extra support that we can't leave behind either. Well, but I'll put the top kids at, at any you school. You got the top and you got the bottom. My concern is the board. Absolutely. Way, I think that's, that's really been ours, Mr. Knapp, our focus also, because that's the group that can get lost and really pushing them to, to do their best, expose them to things that are going to get them from the middle to the to the more. That's really who the advocates are. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. <coughs> that's those kids that they target that they're good. They're not bad students. They may not be great students, and they may, might not be thinking of college, but they do pretty well in the classroom. But it's what kind of moves them up to that next level. Uh, gives them some tools to be successful in, in the classroom, and also gives them helps them set some goals that have to do with uh, higher education. And, uh, you know, you saw the numbers have, are increasing uh, the added participation. Doesn't that, have, uh, doesn't that improve with uh, smaller learning communities as opposed to more buildings, bricks and mortar? Can't you have smaller communities in a, within a school? You know, you talk, you, you, Put your numbers down at, at athletics and fine arts. I wish we put a percentage as opposed to the numbers because class sizes do change considerably. But you know, let's 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 go, let's go athletics. The fact is, if you wouldn't cut anybody from any program to 11th grade, your numbers would skyrocket at, at all the high schools. If you uh, if you would add more art teachers, more fine arts. If you would add those teachers and have more programs instead of the counseling saying, well, I only have 160 slots. And you know that's the way it is. You know? I mean, we've, we've been there. Been there and, and so, you know, I think we have that same opportunity in, in fewer buildings if we if we do it properly. If we staff, if we had the staff, uh, fewer buildings is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Well, okay. uh, uh, Mr. McDaniel, there's no doubt that you can build schools within a school within the same building okay so i mean i I'm, I'm right there with you as far as as far as numbers of participation whether it's athletics fine arts or whatever i will tell you you know when i was the principal of arbor creek middle school for three years we had about 900 kids and i knew nearly every one of those kids i mean one of the few staff members that knew every kid's name when i moved to marcus and for eight years there's no way you can know 3,000 kids I, as a coach, I, as a principal, I, as a counselor, we can get kids more involved when we're not dealing with 3,000 plus. And so that's to me the difference. Now, I didn't decide on the, the, the construction of the building. What I'm telling you, though, is I do believe it's important to be a part of a smaller group, no matter where you're at. That's why so many of us were raised in small, I mean, I'm from West Texas, you know, I mean, raised in a small school where everyone knew everyone but how good to be part of that smaller learning community no matter how where it's at and yet be a part of a bigger picture to where you can have the same opportunities as any other kid no matter where and that's to me at least what we're trying to provide with the so if that method holds true then we should implement the same model as the other high schools who also have 3,000 students right Absolutely. I mean, which is what they're trying to do. Tell me more about that. Well, that's why the, that's why the board decided on ninth grade camps. No, ninth tenth for all the other schools. You know, Mr. Latham, I wasn't a part of the administration. That, I mean, what I'm telling you is the Louisville feeder program is the largest feeder pattern in LISD. I mean, 3,600 kids. And it always happens. So always, right. has been. always has been. Always has been. There's really nothing new, really, about that argument. It's it's the same arguments I'm going. It's the same one that I heard when I walked in the door last year, and we had the workshop about this last March. It's the, the issues not changed. The only thing that's changed is we started harming them, and we now have one year in, it's only ninth. But but the issue. Ninth grade campuses at Hebron or Marcus or Flower Mound or Ninth and Tenth at LHS uh, or just Ninth at LHS or Ninth at one building and Tenth at the other. It's, it's the same argument. 
and uh, there's, there's, there's nothing new here. Um, we're just going back and reviewing the thing that we've already reviewed before. And, uh, and, and, and the board made a decision to go forward with this. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not arguing, I'm not going to argue personally the merits of 9th, 9th and 10th or 9th through 12th. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to take a stance on that. Uh, and I, I don't really have one. In a way, it's kind of a fait accompli. Um, but, you know, I got here. You know, you see, when you change, when you when you go to a new position like I did, you walk in and go, "What's there?" Some things you change, but basically you start, "What's in place?" And you work with it. Um, some of it's bricks and mortar, some of it's culture, some of it's you know traditions and it's various things. But the things that were in place were that Hebron had a nice big center and there was momentum, and Louisville had had one for a long time. And there appeared to be in the intention of putting them at uh, Flower Mountain Markets. Um, the ninth and tenth grade was proposed and was planned. The building was under construction. Um, nonetheless, we reviewed it last year and voted to go ahead. And I'll be at a close vote, but still it was a vote. And, uh, but the, the, the issue of whether ninth is better than ninth and tenth, or ninth and tenth is better than ninth, or, or the uh, nine twelfth configuration, but the thing is, is uh, this is where we're at at this point in time. And uh, those are the gifts. Um, it's, it's really, at least my, my perception of this, it's more of an issue of given all that, where are we right now? You know, and, and uh, We've already left the gate, and we're somewhere down the track. And so, it's a it's a question of, of uh, what are we going to do? Uh, so the, the merits of the configurations, you know, we can talk about that all the time at infinitum, and I don't think we get anywhere. It's it's just a question of what are we going to do at this point? We we have the two campuses operating. We have a building that has been built. It's occupied and it's being paid for, <clears throat> and we have the building staff, and we have we've been operating on some sense of direction. Um, so uh, to me, that's where we're at at this point. So, am I understanding you to say there's there's no turning back, there's no way of changing. We have no opportunity to before we tear down what's at LHS. We have no opportunity to build that to house 10 through 12 so that Louisville can have the same high school experience as the other communities. No, I, I, I don't think anything's impossible. I think there's issues. It's, it's kind of like an old mentor of mine, um, you know, Dr. Bob Thompson down at Beaumont and Lamar would always say, is for everything that you consider, there's, there's consequences. And it's good consequences and bad consequences. And, and you look at those and say, you know, <coughs> can you live with it? You know, so no, I, I'm, it, I'm not going to say it's impossible. It's not. You know, it's not. Um, it's a question of what are the consequences related to that? You know, given where we're at today, you know, on April 30th, 2012, uh, with some momentum going uh, with the concept that was put in place last year. What are the pros and cons regarding a shift in direction? And, and, and are we willing to, you know, is do, uh, you know, in terms of going back and in the direction or proceeding with the direction we have, you know, are those consequences in our, in our, in our, and can we live with them, whichever way we go? That's, that's the big question. What about the consequences uh, running three building with redundant teachers? Redundancies in teachers, redundancies in administration, additional utilities, the additional transportation costs, and then we're looking at, 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 you know, having to cut how much out of the budget next year. So, you know, we're looking at consequences throughout the district because we're pouring millions and millions back into one system that, that, that you know, we've chosen not to do that anywhere else in the district. Well, you've chosen to do it to a large degree in every campus, except for 
So well, we don't have three campuses at any. I mean, whether it's 9, 10, 11, 12, or just 9, 11 through 12, or 10 through 12, I, that doesn't matter to me. But three campuses, you know, there are a lot of redundancies and a lot of expenses that, that you know, where are we going to cut so that we can continue that? Um, you're going to have redundancies to some degree in having more than one campus, more than one. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, and we have those at the various campuses. There's, there's two principals at Eva. Um, there's, there's assistant principals at both those buildings. Um, you try to cut that down as much as possible, I think. <clears throat> and I don't know, I don't know what all the redundancies are. I don't have a catalog or a list of that. Um, and I don't question there probably are some, and certainly there is on the administrative standpoint. That's easy to see. Uh, but I think that we tried to, we we would want to try, and I'm sure we have, to eliminate those as much as possible. Obviously, when you when you have a system like this, you're going to try to make it as efficient as possible. And, and I have no question that we've done that. You know, if there's ways to make it more efficient, then we're going to look to do that too. But you know, obviously, uh, when we went into this, the decision was made this way forward. Our goal is to make it as efficient as possible. Uh, I think looking at the, uh, what they've done on transportation is a good example. Now it's not redundancy, but it is an efficiency. Uh, <clears throat> but I think if you make a decision to divide any campus, um, then you're going to have some of that going on. It's going to be more costly. It's going to be costly. You got to build a building. I, I keep using the Hebron campus as an example, but you could use um, the, the the first ninth grade center at Louisville also as an example. You're running a separate building. You've got a different principal. And you've got an assistant principal over there, counselors. And if they were all on one campus, you wouldn't have to do that. Um, and so you start moving down that redundancy efficiency. Get a uh, trade off as soon as you create a different building. And this district has a, has a history of that over a period of years. And Buddy commented that he hadn't received any phone calls, and I find that disturbing because I have called you a couple times and said, I've just given you this parent your phone number. Correct. Let me tell and you I've just I, given you this student your phone number. Yeah, let me tell you, I can substantiate the phone call to say, I moved over to the operations side of the house. I started a phone call. And I've, I've logged every phone call I've gotten. That the name's attached to. And you know, I've talked about mom and a couple of times. Uh, since the beginning of the year, every phone call, it's a, it's a problem. And, and most of them are in the nature. You know, most of them are in the nature. I've got one phone call on Harmon, and I've got zero phone calls in this as far as on the LA. But you know that I have received those phone calls because I called you and alerted you, hey, you and I I've called. just given you, given your phone number out to this person. Yeah, my recollection of our conversations we've had, we've had with you uh, have been, uh, well, I, I do have some recollection. Right. Calls, so that just tells me that we still don't have that trust factor for people to to reach out all the way. And we've had a lot of conversations about that. At, yes, ma'am, we absolutely have. It is, uh, it is discouraging sometimes. But that's something we earn, and you and I have talked about that. You know, the, the trust factor is something that we will earn back. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and we're making strides. We're just not oh, there. Sorry. But I have received phone calls about the time that they've spent on the bus, the time that they're missing from class. Um, I can't take this class because it's during second period, and there's no transfer bus during second period. Um, but you're getting the calls. Am I hearing it right? You're doing the call, but then they're not turning around and calling Buddy. I've right? given out Buddy's phone number, but they they don't call. I'm afraid my kid's going to be targeted. I'm afraid, you know, my kid's going to be um, singled out in such and such class. Or yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's uh, that's unfortunately the system. And I will even human resources, you know, people are, are loath to step forward for whatever reasons, for whatever reasons, and it does diminish the opportunity. scheduling or transportation or whatever. And I will say one thing about that transportation issue. I love to ride buses. So I, I heard you ride buses. I, I just didn't call you and say, hey, what's wrong with buses? Yeah, I can uh, substantiate that for sure. So <laughs> this is before this ever came up. So a concern I have, I guess my biggest concern here is uh, 
I like to think long term. I think we kind of got in this situation by not thinking long term because I think we had some opportunities and we missed along the way. So now we're fixing it or discussing it or whatever. But as we look, we're, we're using a block schedule now and went through four periods of the day. If by chance that needs to change down the road, maybe in the near future, uh, financial considerations or we have the opportunity to offer special programs, classes, or whatever, we don't want Louisville High School to be left out with the other campuses can participate in. Does that busing from the three campuses 